Metro Nashville Network. Uh, this is the uh, October 4th Affordable Housing Committee meeting. Uh, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. All right. Um, thanks, everyone. Um, this is my first meeting as the chair of the Affordable Housing Committee. I'm super excited to serve um, and looking forward to some good work this year. Um, go ahead and begin by taking attendance. Councilmember Parker here, Alan Hauser, Mendez, Sepulveda, Councilmember Sledge, Councilmember Suara, Councilmember Taylor is here, Councilmember Toombs, and Councilmember Welsh. All right, excellent. We've just got five items on our agenda, so I am, uh, we'll just run through them one by one here. Um, resolution 2021 uh, 1166 by O'Connell, Parker, Allen, and others. Um, accepts a donation from the Congress group in the amount of two and a half million dollars as a contribution to the Barnes Housing Trust Fund and approving a donation from the Congress group in the amount of $500,000 to a to be formed nonprofit entity for the benefit of Wharf Park. Uh, do I have a motion? All right, moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion on this one? Councilmember Allen. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just, just one question. Does this uh, money then become additional money on top of what we've already allocated for the Barnes Fund this year? I think maybe Mr. Jamison can answer that. I'll that the that metro makes this is additional this is additional that's awesome great i fully support it fantastic thank you um any other discussion or questions about 1166 all right um let's vote uh, all those in favor Aye. any opposed any abstentions all right thank you that is approved um 10 Eight, seven? seven. Favor. Who do I have that you don't have? I have eight people here. Oh, I marked Suara. My apologies. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Okay, up next we have um, resolution 2021-1117 by Parker, Allen, and Welsh authorizes the Metro Mayor to submit the Nashville Davidson Cares Act Substantial Amendment 3 to the 2019 to 2020 Annual Action Plan to the 2018-23 Consolidated Plan for Housing and Community Development to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Um, do I have a motion? All right, it's been moved and seconded. Um, is there anyone here um, in the gallery who could just give us a description of, of what this accomplishes here? Um, you're, you should be recognized. Good evening. Emil Alexander, Director of Community Development at MDHA. This is an amendment to our substantial, our action plan that was passed by this council in July of 2020. It allows us to reallocate funding to provide supportive services for the homeless that will go out through an RFA to homeless service providers. And this just approves us to submit the substantial um, amendment to HUD for review and approval. Excellent, thank you, sir. Are there any other questions or discussion about RS 2021-1172? All right, hearing none, um, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, we recommend approval, um, is it eight now? Eight to zero. All right, up next we have resolution 2021-1173 by Parker, Allen, and Welsh authorizes uh, MDHA to negotiate and enter into a pilot agreement and accepts payment in lieu of ad valorem taxes with respect to a multifamily housing project located at 900 Dickerson Pike, known as 900 Dickerson. Um, could we have a motion and a second? Thank you. Um, so I'll begin the discussion. I'm, I'm super excited about this project. Been working with uh, Dominium on this for a little while. Um, 
if I could ask someone from MDHA just to, to answer just a, um, a super quick question about this. Good afternoon, Joe Kane with MDHA. Thank you, sir. Um, so just in, in reviewing some of the documents, um, it, it appears that some portion of the property where this development is occurring is owned by MDHA, is that correct? Not currently owned by MDHA. The property will transfer to MDHA as okay. part of the pilot. Excellent, excellent, thank you. And the term of the pilot is limited to 10 years, so um, are, are there other um, uh, uh, mechanisms sort of ensuring affordability at this project beyond 10 years, or is that going to be the, the extent of the affordability term? No, it'll, it'll be extended. They enter into agreements through THDA with land use restrictions that are recorded um, that are recorded against the property. And I believe this one has 30 year restriction on that. That's fantastic, thank you so much. Any other questions for Mr. Kane, council members? I believe that's it. Um, uh, council member Mendez, you're recognized. Thanks, um, chair, our new chair. Um, so this is really, um, it's for finance who I don't see. Um, so I'm gonna mention it to, for Mr. Jameson, and maybe this can be a project after there's a new finance director. Um, so this particular program has, well, you know what, I'm just gonna save it for budget and finance, because um, it's more about money than the affordability of this. Um, all right, so sorry for wasting time, Chair. That's quite all right, <laughs> Council Member. All right, any other, dis uh, Council Member Allen, you are recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We get, we get this explanation frequently, but I just need to keep hearing it until it sinks in. Can can someone from MDHA explain wh how the math is done to determine what the abatement is and why sometimes it's 95% and sometimes it's 50% um, and what that what that's based on? I mean, I, I know this is a highly successful program. I just would love to understand this piece of it better. It It, it actually depends on each individual project it depends on whether they received 4% credits or 9% credits, and that is usually the biggest kicker in between the two of them. 9% credits, they get more cash for, the, for, their, for their project to invest into their project than the 4%. So if you have a 4% tax credit, which these are, you're going to see a greater reduction in property taxes because they did not get that much cash equity in the beginning. The other, the other discrepancy that you see is there is between new construction and rehab um, with those. And so those are the differences in, that, are, that are playing as to why there's some differences. But we, we value each project individually based on its own merits. Thank you, um, Mr. Kane and Council Member Allen. Um, any other uh, questions or discussions on 1174? I'm sorry, we're still on 1173. All right, um, so uh, we'll go ahead and take a vote. So all those for 1173, say aye. Uh, any against? Any abstentions? Thank you. All right, up next we have um, RS 2021-1174 by Sledge, Parker, Allen, and Welsh. Uh, this authorizes MDHA to negotiate and enter into a pilot agreement and accept payments in lieu of ad valorem taxes with respect to a multifamily housing project located at 300 Rains Avenue, known as Fairgrounds Site C. Um, do we have a motion? A second? All right, um, properly moved and seconded. Um, is there any discussion or questions from um, committee members on this one. Council Member Allen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I know this goes back to the, the larger agreement that was made as part of the fairgrounds um, negotiations. And if someone could, uh, number one, just uh, explain to the listening audience how many units for whom this is gonna provide and then how that fits into what the larger agreement was in terms of affordable housing. Thank you. Is there anyone um, from the gallery who could speak to the specifics of this arrangement? Uh, thank you, Councilmember Allen, for your question. Uh, I'm Dirk Melton with the applicant of this uh, case. 
Um, so uh, there's a lot of affordability components to this particular project. The pilot is subject to the 120 units that will be dedicated for individuals earning 60% or less median income as part of our LIHTC application with THDA. And so that's the only part of this that's subject to that affordability category. As you're well aware, and as Councilman Sledge is well aware, um, there's a community benefits asso agreement associated with this project. Uh, this makes a significant contribution toward meeting those goals and obligations. Uh, there will be affordability in every phase of the project, but this is going to go a long way toward uh, meeting that first step. One, one follow-up question. So, so what you're saying is there are 120 units in this phase, in this in this block, and then there will be subsequent blocks that will also include affordable units. Yes, ma'am. That's correct. Thank you. Council Member Hauser. And the question that I have is, will they be specific apartments, or just you need to have a percentage of all of yours? of the total that will be affordable? How, how will that be managed? That, that's a good question. Um, they, they will be uh, throughout the project. Um, in this particular project, uh, because of the THDA regulations around low-income low housing tax credits, there will be a separate condominium that identifies the affordable units within the project. However, they are indistinguishable in terms of finishes, location, amenities, and services uh, from the marker rate units. So no, nobody will know which are which, are which, but the legal structure of the way this is set up will identify those and they, they will be um, allocated uh, pursuant to the application that we've made. So when you're looking at uh, applications from prospective tenants on those specific units, you would be adding an extra component of their income needed to be below a certain level. Yes, and as part of their application process, if they qualify by income for those units, then those will become available to them and they'll have their selection of the unit that they would like to have. So, hypothetically, if you have a unit that becomes available and you didn't have any applicants that fit that criteria, I know that's very unlikely, but if you did, you would just have to hold that unit until you found someone that met, met that income criteria. Yes, ma'am. Those are dedicated for individuals that meet those income requirements. And, and it's been our experience, and I think others in the gallery could speak to this. Um, there will be plenty of customers oh, I know. I, I for, for this type that. of product. I was just trying to make sure that, that there, there was a mechanism that said yes, so we don't suddenly have a reduced number just because. Yeah, the level of affordability that we're committing to will be present for the duration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, and, and I just wanted to, because I had a couple of people reach out to me via email and phone about this one. Um, I just wanted to comment, and I believe it's been explained, you know, the, the concern that I was hearing was that there were X number of units, you know, committed to within the CBA. Um, and, and it's my understanding that this is just one phase of the overall development and that as, as Council Member Allen um, asked and, and had explained that future phases will include additional units beyond this. So this is strictly for this um, Site C phase. So just to make that super clear for the folks who had, who had reached out with, with comments and concerns about this. Um, any other discussion or questions on RS 2021-1174? All right. Um, all those in favor, say aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Mm -hmm. All right. So that we recommend approval uh, nine to zero. Um, and then we have one bill on second reading here. Um, this is BL 2021-912 by Alan O'Connell, Suarez, and Porterfield. Um, I have a letter here to defer one meeting. Um, Council Member Allen, would you like any opportunity to discuss this today or do you want to just go ahead and defer it? I'm sorry, we need to, so can someone move it please? I'll move it. Um, I, actually, I would like to move to defer two meetings. Thank you, with a brief explanation. Um, I, I will explain this because it's complicated and it's probably gonna take two or three <laughs> explanations before um, it, it begins to make sense. This is a companion bill um, to 832, which is further on the agenda. Um, between the two of them, what this is seeking to do is to make use of the downtown codes bonus height program, which will allow buildings downtown to build additional height if they meet certain conditions that provide a public good, which uh, there's, a, there's a choice of those that they can choose from. It, it could be sustainability, it could be extra parking, or in this case, it can be um, residences that are set aside, set aside for income qualified 
tenants. We have worked with a lot of lawyers uh, to very carefully craft this language so that it is consistent with the requirements of the state legislation. And that is done through setting up a master lease agreement so that the owner of the building is paid market rate and that there is a third party administrator who uh, vets the income qualified tenants and they pay that person 30% of their income. And the difference is made up um, by a fund that is created by this bill. So there's one bill that sets up the program. There's a second bill that creates a fund in Metro with a specific number. And it, the money that comes into it is, is from the additional property taxes that are generated by allowing the different floors. Um, mm -hmm. So this is working its way through the planning commission and it hasn't had time to go to them for hearing, um, partly because as we know, their agenda has been pushed forward. Uh, and also I'm still working with financial people to make sure we've got the, the math completely figured out correctly. So this will come back again and I will explain it again and I'm happy to answer any questions between now and then. Uh, Matt Wiltshire is here, MDHA is, is a potential third party administrator. They would be uh, a very well informed one, uh, but this, this bill does not limit them uh, to being the only possibility to do that. Um, so I, I, will, I will happily answer questions, Matt can answer questions um, and this will, this will be back and we can further explain it again and again. I'm happy to say the same thing over and, again, over and over again if I need to. So I move for a two meeting deferral, which is different from what I asked on the other bill, but in speaking with Lisa Milligan, that's what I need to do for them to track together. I think Council Member Allen, um, Council Member Mendez. Uh. Thanks, um, in the spirit of, we may have to talk about this a few times before it's up for approval. I've got two questions uh, for the sponsor and then a couple of comments. The two questions are, is there any sort of annual financial cap associated with this? And is there a sunset proposed in it? I just haven't had a chance to figure that out yet. I think that's for me. Um, yes, there. I don't believe a sunset is built in, but I'm willing to do that if that's, uh, that's something that makes people more comfortable, we would clearly need to continue it for the people who have committed to it so that they don't think it's going to go away out from underneath them. Um, and it, in the spirit of many discussions that we've had about just being more deliberate about deciding how much money we think is appropriate to pull out of the general fund for worthy things like this, um, absolutely there will be a cap on that. I think it's already spelled out, but I'll, I'll go back and look. And if it's not, that's something that, that we would intend to add. You're shaking your head. I, I, I've got another bill that I'm working on that, that is not been filed yet, and I don't know what's written into at least one of them. So if it's not in this one, we can, we can certainly do that. Um, this will be, again, it will be generating its own income, but we, as you, you know, through the, the tax increment financing study that you did, based on, uh, you know, input from citizens that we don't want to take so much money out of the general fund for things that we think are good because then it can't go to schools. I understand that concern and, and I'm willing to work with you on that. Just, just for clarity, Ms. Zeitlin, there isn't a cap, is there? There's no cap built into the bill. So there is, you know, a calculation that uses the new um, tax generated, but there's no cap on, you know, total amount per year or, or number of, you know, applicants who could uh, use this per year. All right, thank you. Um, so, so those are the two questions. The, the two comments are, and, and you know, the outside lawyers who have been drafting this um, have sought comment from me previously. And so there's, there's no uh, surprise here. Um, but uh, the two things are, um, as we left the tax increment financing reform of last term, where the amount of money Metro spending on tax increment financing more or less quadrupled in a handful of years, um, I've told everybody um, administration, IDB, MDHA, council members, um, private groups, that I firmly believe this city needs to have a policy about how much money of property tax revenue it wants to dedicate um, to, to pull out of the regular appropriation process and figure out once you know that amount um, on a multi-year time horizon, then figure out what you want to spend it on and where. 
And um, this is, I commented a couple months ago when a piece of legislation came around, this, um, th this is ready um, fire aim in that there's no known policy about how much money we wanna spend on affordable housing. I'm all in favor of affordable housing. Obviously I've, I've been a, a sponsor or a drafter of everything we've passed in the last six years on that front, but we have to know what we're spending. And I would say, other than the possible exception of Mr. Wiltshire, nobody in this room could get within $5 million of what we spend on affordable housing between um, pilots and um, the TDHA tied pilots and Barnes Fund and tax abatements. I don't think anybody could get within 5 million bucks of that. And we ought to be able to figure that out by the time we pass this bill so we can make intelligent decisions about whether this is the best use of um, our funds. That's comment one. Comment two will be shorter. Um, there's a pretty good argument that um, this is largely a height giveaway to developers. And it's not clear that we need to give away quite as much to accomplish the good um, that this would do, assuming it fit with our fiscal goals. And between now and when we consider this um, uh, on a final reading, um, I, I'll want to hopefully learn more about whether we really need to give away um, that much height um, in order to accomplish the good that we're trying to accomplish here. Maybe the answer is yes, um, but, but I think that's a question that's worth exploring. And so thank you for indulging me, Chair. Thank you, Council Member Mendez. And, and I think you bring up a lot of really great points and I would, uh, I'll do a little more research and maybe we can have um, a little bit more in depth discussion the next time this is heard. So um, thank you all for bringing that up. Um, right now we've got a motion to defer two meetings on the floor. Any other discussions or questions? All right, um, so all those in favor of a two meeting deferral, please say aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right, so that is 10. Yeah. All right, 10 in favor, none against. A two meeting deferral, and that is it for our agenda. We've got about five minutes before budget starts, so thank you all. <laughs>